Welcome to To See or Not to See, written by Ruth Bieber, directed by Philip Wagner, and produced by Ruth Bieber. To See or Not to See takes place in present-day rural and suburban settings in Canada. An ensemble of 13 actors play over 20 characters in this performance. The central character, Elizabeth, is played by Janet Anderson. She is a white woman, 5 feet 5 inches tall, 50 years old. She has shoulder-length, straight blonde hair with bangs. She is blind and often wears dark glasses, though she takes them off while she is at home. The action begins in Elizabeth's home office in the present day and then moves to a secluded place in the forest. From here, the scenes shift into a dreamlike sequence as Elizabeth travels back in time, encountering people and places from her past. These shifts in time and place in Elizabeth's memory are established by the dialogue and by pools of light in different areas on a bare stage. Minimal props, chairs, and tables are brought on and off by the cast as needed. In the first scene, Elizabeth is trying to work at home through an onslaught of phone calls and interruptions that include Richard, her colleague in an arts organization, an annoying telemarketer, Michael, her selkie boyfriend, a receptionist for the loans department of a bank, and her son Matt, a tall, skinny teenager who barges in to ask for money. The next scene shifts to a park bench where Elizabeth meets Marv, a tall, elderly white man dressed in casual brown clothing and leather sandals. Marv takes Elizabeth to a secluded hillside where he lights a sacred fire. After a brief ceremony, he leaves her alone by the fire. Soon, Elizabeth experiences visions and memories from her past. Little Beth is Elizabeth at eight years old. Her straight blonde hair is in pigtails, and she wears a blue, pale, cotton sundress with ankle socks and runners and bright plastic-framed glasses. She is played by May Glarum. Elizabeth's father is a heavy-set farmer with a German accent. Elizabeth's sons, Matt, 15 years old, and Ryan, 19, interrupt with a more recent memory. Then the scene shifts back to childhood again with little Beth's school chum Colleen. A shadowy figure, Otorongo, wearing a golden jaguar mask, appears and guides Elizabeth to another series of memories. Young adult Elizabeth wears a swinging red dress, striding confidently, carrying a folding white cane, and she is played by Amy Wagner. At the bank, young Elizabeth meets with two loans officers, half-human, half-vulture, wearing business suits with vulture masks over their heads. Memory shifts again to the side of a mountain in the sacred valley of Cusco, with Samuel, a mountain guide and friend, then further back in time to high school, with teenaged friends Ronnie, Brian, and Corrine. Finally, as the story moves back to Elizabeth's childhood on the farm, Elizabeth's mother appears, faded and weary, the last piece of the puzzle. To See or Not to See is 78 minutes long with no intermission. Please enjoy the show. The Alliance for the Equality of Blind Canadians, Central Okanagan Chapter, and playwright Ruth Bieber present To See or Not to See. A pool of light on a chair and table. On it, a landline phone and a cell phone. A woman, Elizabeth, feels her way to the chair and collapses into it. As she answers various callers, a pool of coloured light comes up on each. Hello, Elizabeth speaking. Hey, Elizabeth, it's Richard. Oh, hey, Richard. I'm expecting a call from my lawyer. Oh, there it is now. Can you hold on a minute? I'll see if this is her. Hello, Elizabeth speaking. Hello, is Mrs. Barbara Smith in the house? This is a charity she likes to support. No, thank you. Damn phone solicitors. What can I do for you, Richard? Well, you know those flyers Cheryl sent out? They've got the wrong dates on it for our next performance. <sighs> There's my other line again. Hello. Is Mrs. Barbara Smith there? Didn't you get the message the first time? Oh, Richard, you've got to be kidding. I had one of my board members review that flyer. Shit! Oh, there's my other line again. Hello. Could I please speak to Mrs. Barbara Smith? Don't you understand? A teenage no. boy runs hey, in. Mom, I need 20 bucks. What are you doing home from school? Hey, Mom, I need 20 bucks. Can't you see I'm on the phone? Richard, the joys of having a home office. <laughs> oh, just hang on a sec. Hello, Elizabeth speaking. Hi, Elizabeth. It's me, Michael. 
There's something I needed to talk to you about. I really don't have time. I wouldn't have answered, but I thought it might be my lawyer calling. I'm being pulled in six different directions. Yeah, that's another thing I want to talk to you about. You never have time for me. Well, I sure don't have time right now. How about after... Hello? Mom, I gotta get back to school. And I need 20 bucks. Hey, your kettle's boiling. Richard, thanks so much for your patience. Now, about that flyer. Oh, crap. Michael, why did you hang up on me? That's no way to get my attention. Hello, this is McBride and McBride calling. You wanted to set up an appointment with a lawyer? Oh, yes. Mom, I gotta get back. Do you have the money or not? What? Oh, sh Richard, I think I just hung up on my lawyer. Oh, there's my other line again. Hello. I would really like to speak to Mrs. Barbara Smith. This is the last time I'm going to tell you. There is no Mrs. Barbar Schmidt here. She died after the divorce, never to be resurrected. If you call again, you'll meet the same fate. And while I'm at it, you should know that I am the director of my own charity. And I am blind. Oh, Richard, I'm so sorry. This is just insane. Now, what are we going to do about that flyer? Do you have the money or not? This is my friend. Do you have the money or not? This is my friend. Do you have the money or not? This is my friend. Do you have the money or not? Throws her arms over her head. Lights snap off. Lights up on Elizabeth wearing dark glasses, sitting with Marv, an elderly man dressed all in brown. So, you're a shaman. That is the rumor. <laughs> One of your students told me that you can help me get my eyesight back. Is that true? How long have you been blind, and what were the circumstances around your loss of sight? Well, I lost my sight very suddenly, just after my ninth birthday. The cause of blindness is unknown, so they say it's genetic. At least that's the short version. Mm -hmm. Do tell. Well, it's all very mysterious. Uh, the doctors don't know why I lost my sight, and I've broken the rules all the way. Can you give me an example? About ten years ago, I started seeing colors in the energy field. I can't tell you what color the objects around me are, but... Everything I see is as if through a filter of color. Isn't that strange? Well, sounds entertaining. <laughs> that it is. <laughs> color is such a gift, but it's just another example of my unorthodox experience. Why do you want to see again? Isn't that obvious? It seems obvious to most people. Well, I'm not like most people. Oh, well... Most people simply assume that I'll be a more whole human being if I regained my sight. Oh, then you could drive a car, or then you could see that gorgeous sunset, or that stunning mountain range. <laughs> but I think what they're really saying is that I have something vital missing that makes me less than a whole human being. Mm. In the shamanic world, we don't think in conventional ways. Most of life's an illusion. We rely on the voices of nature to give us messages about important decisions. Many people in our modern world have lost touch with the, the earth, the four directions and the sky, father, son, grandmother, moon and the stars. But when we learn to sit very quietly, we can hear those messages. And when we learn to sit very still, we can see things. Shamanism belongs to everyone. I can teach you if you wish. What do you mean? Messages from whom? Well, the messages can come from any part of nature. That is what I would teach you. Even mosquitoes? <laughs> oh, especially mosquitoes. Oh. <laughs> and all the creatures of the earth have special messages. The shamanic way is a very different way of looking at life. And that's why I want to know, why do you want to regain your eyesight? Spirits may or may not agree with you. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Just, just fill me in. Well, my life has been full. I've been married, divorced. I have two beautiful sons, Ryan and Matt. Two university degrees. I've traveled all over the world and I have my own theater company. But, to be honest, I'm getting a little worn out. It's all good, but 
I'm burning out and I'm wondering if by getting my eyesight back, my life might be a lot easier. Mm. Well, you don't sound overly convinced. The research is not in my favor. Most people who get their eyesight back as a result of medical advancements go into profound depression. Some even become suicidal or simply choose to go blind again. It's a major adjustment and yes, I'm afraid. What do you think your purpose in life is? I don't know. We'll try. Okay. I once had a spiritual leader tell me that my purpose in life is to manage those people around me who might benefit from assisting me. Hmm. I doubt that this spiritual uh, leader and my spirit teachers are hanging out together. But um, why don't you explain this point in a bit more detail for me? Well, first I have to find them. Then I have to educate them about myself and my needs. Then I have to help them feel comfortable around me. And then finally, after all is said and done, I have to be grateful. Perhaps your purpose in life is to inspire others. I've had people tell me that they've started university because if I could do it, they could do it too. And there are those people who watch me climb mountains or direct plays and they say if I can do it, they can do it too. <laughs> but after a while, I start to wonder what's in it for me. I'm just getting tired. You know, I've been doing some tracking while you've been speaking, and uh, I have to tell you, Elizabeth, your energy field has got more holes in it than a porcupine has quills. <laughs> now, I can help you fill some of them if you wish, but I don't, I'm not so sure we should fill them all. Well, what do you mean, holes in my energy field? Oh, pinpricks that cause you to react from fear rather than act from a place of self-assurance and ease. Well, why not fill them all? Because you've obviously used fear throughout your entire life to propel yourself forward. If you fill all the holes, ironically, you might just deflate. Oh, that doesn't sound too promising. But then neither does being full of holes. That's why I suggest we go slow. Not too sure I care for going slow either. I'm feeling overwhelmed, ready for an easier life. Slow and steady, one hole at a time. And in the meantime, you might consider a vision quest. What's that? Well, a vision quest is a private ceremony to help people answer the big questions in their lives. I would ask Spirit for the location and I would take you there myself. I alone will know where you are. When we arrive, the first thing I will do is open sacred space. I will show you how this is done. Together, we will call upon the protection of the four directions, Pachamama, Earth, and the sky, the mighty Jaguar, Otorongo, will help you to cross into the world of spirit and all of nature will harmonize for your benefit. And I will leave you and you will be alone, but not by yourself. Also, you will have with you only water and enough clothing to keep you warm at night. It's like a time out. It may last anywhere from 18 to 48 hours, depending on how long it takes for spirit to speak to you. Essentially, it's an opportunity to spend time alone in nature, paying attention to the many messages that are given by the wind, the trees, the animals, the clouds, and the environment in general. Remember, very still, and very quiet. Does this make sense? Is that all? <laughs> How do we start? By gathering twigs. Just trust me. Are you in? Call me nervous, but willing. Call me Marv. <laughs> <laughs> Can you show me how to open sacred space now? Sure. Let's go to a place I have chosen with Spirit's guidance. Uh, you'll need to gather your things.
He picks up a wool blanket. She shoulders a satchel. And here we are at last, high on the top of a hill. I knew that. <laughs> We're overlooking a prairie. And there is a circle of stones around our sacred space. The stones are surrounding a fire I have prepared. They spread out the blanket. He fans the fire's smoke. Oh, I hear it. I smell it. I feel it. Now, where are those twigs, I wonder? He uncovers twigs, hands them to her. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> Now, Elizabeth, we're going to open sacred space. We're going to open sacred space by calling upon each of the four directions. In the Inca tradition, we will call upon the spirits who reside there and ask for their protection and their guidance. The words we will use are ancient words. The actions will signify honor and respect. We will begin by calling upon the south first, and then the other directions in turn, and then our sweet Mother Earth, Pachamama, and finally the sky. Does this make sense? Yes. Okay. Let's turn now. She turns 90 degrees. Face towards the south. Counterclockwise. Now, point in the direction you are facing. Oh, and don't forget to say ho. Ho? Yes, after I call upon each direction, it's like an, an accent, an amen of sorts. But you have to say it like you mean it. Are you ready? Ho! Oh. She stands, her arm pointing. He paces in a semicircle as he pulls out and shakes a stick covered in bells. He points, his arm next to hers. To the winds of the south, great serpent such a mama, mother of the waters, wrap your coils of light around us. Teach us to heal ourselves by shedding what no longer serves. Ho! Oh. Oh. <laughs> and now we turn to face the west. Holding her shoulders, he turns her 90 degrees. raises his arm next to hers. To the winds of the west, great jaguar Otorongo, protect our medicine space. Teach us the way of peace to live impeccably and show us the way across the rainbow bridge. Ho! Ho! Now to the north. Turns her 90 degrees. Raises his arm next to hers. To the winds of the north, hummingbird Suakentai, grandmothers and grandfathers, ancient ones, teach us the miracle way to drink from the nectar of life. Ho! Oh. Oh. Now, to the east. Turns her 90 degrees. Raises his arm next to hers. To the winds of the east, great eagle condor Apuchin, show us the mountains we only dare to dream of. Teach us to fly wing to wing with the great spirit. Ho! Oh. Oh. And now we bend to earth 
Um, no. They squat down, facing the fire. Sweet Pachamama Earth, we are gathered for the healing of all your children. The stone people, the plant people, the two-legged, the four-legged, the creepy crawlers, the furred, the finned, and the winged ones. All our relations. Ho! Ho! And finally, to the spirits above. She reaches a hand over her head. His arm raised next to hers. To the star nations, thank you for bringing us together and for allowing us to sing the song of life. Ho. Ho. Now, where are those twigs? Because you're going to need oh, them. They're right here. What do I do with them? When called upon by spirit to do so, you will breathe into them and cast them into the fire. He starts to go. Now what? You're not really leaving me here alone, are you? This is your vision quest. The rest is up to you. But who can I call on if I get into trouble out here alone in the wild? Rest assured you will be safe at all times, as I have called upon Otorongo to protect you. Huh? Jaguar, the dreamer. He will show you the way across the Rainbow Bridge. Just think rainbow. Are you sure? I'm very sure. You're leaving me here with twigs? They are called arrows. Think of that as you breathe into them and cast them into the fire. You now have everything you need. I suggest you stay close by the fire and keep your items nearby. Water, blanket, and twigs. It is time for me to go. I will know when to return. He goes. She sits cross-legged on the blanket, places the twigs beside her, warms her hands over the fire. Over Elizabeth's right shoulder, a pulsing pool of light appears, dim at first, becoming brighter. A second pulsing pool of light appears to the left of the first one. A third pool of light appears to the left of the second, so they are in a row. The shadowy forms of nine people pace slowly in and cross behind Elizabeth. They pass through the pools of light and keep walking, passing back out into darkness and away. A young girl with loose, long blonde hair and glasses, wearing a cotton sundress, skips in next to Elizabeth and kneels to tie her shoe. When I was little, I tied my shoe the first time I tried, and with no help from anyone. Who are you? Did Marv send you to meet me? You'll see. What will I see? We don't know yet. That's why we're here. Well, can't you at least give me a hint? The girl jumps and I runs. I love going fast. The faster, the better. It's so easy. Such a breeze. Betty, slow down. But I like driving fast, Papa. But you're a little girl who cannot see. No, you have to wait. It's not time for that yet. Stops off. What? Why are you leaving? Wait, don't go. Two young men stroll in, one reading a newspaper, one holding a skateboard. Hey, sponge it. Guess what? Don't call me Spongehead. You should talk. I am talking, Matt. So shut up and listen. Get out with it then. I was over at Steve's place today. His mom saw our mom on TV and in the newspaper. Is that all? What are you talking about? Not everybody's parents make the media. Whatever. Are you kidding? She's really impressed. She read the whole thing out loud in front of my friends and everything. You know what would impress me, Ryan? 
I can only begin to imagine. If mom could drive a car, now that would be impressive. They freeze as Elizabeth tries to talk to them. Matt! Ryan! Don't leave me here alone! I did my best. Look at you. You're fine young men. I'm so proud of you. They unfreeze. You know, she gets around okay. You're missing my point, Dimwit. I mean, what about us? No person could spend their entire life on a bus. You can see it now. I'll turn 16 years old, and I'll miss my own party. Because I'll stop somewhere on a bus. Yeah, see, now you're exaggerating. I take the bus. I've got a job. I see my friends. It's no big deal. Yeah, and that's another thing. What? Forget it. No, no, you said it. What? Hey. Well, you're almost 20. It's bad enough that mom can't drive, but you've never even tried to get your license. What's up with that? That's... You know, I don't want one, man. It's nuts out there. I think it's something else. Oh, you do, huh? Like what? Like I think everybody's just waiting for me to get a driver's license. Then I'll do everything around here. <laughs> Why couldn't mom have just married the guy with the car? At least he could drive. What is this, dump on mom day or something? That guy was psychotic. You know what? Forget it. You don't know what I'm talking about. <sighs> Matt! Of course I do. Not everybody else has a blind mom, right? It's weird. I'm just trying to figure out how to get places. And... Asking other people's parents for rides. Trying to get taxis and snowstorms. Possible. Oh, even that trip to the Bahamas, the Miami airport, remember that? Unbelievable, what a disaster that was. Elizabeth strains to hear their conversation, but cannot until the crows subside. We just bought Miss Nuck's flight. Yeah, blind woman coming through. Blind woman coming through. We didn't get luggage for three days. Oh, it's a good thing all we need to buy our new bathing suits, right? Matt pulls a faded note card from his pocket. What do you got there? Matt thrusts the note card at Ryan. Read this. Dear Ryan, sorry your mom is blind. Happy Valentine's Day, Steve. So what, I got this Valentine in grade two? In other words, sorry your mom can't drive. Sorry your mom can't read the paper. Furiously crumples note, hurls it to the ground. I'm sorry, you are such a dickhead! Ryan gives Matt's shoulder a hug, picks up Valentine from ground. Where'd you find this thing anyway? The junk drawer. I was looking for duct tape for my skate. Wow. What were you gonna do with this anyway? I don't know. Look, I gotta go, the guys are waiting. See you on the flip side. Matt throws down his skateboard and skates off. Ryan stares at Valentine. Dear Ryan, sorry your mother is blind. Happy Valentine's Day. Idiot. Ryan storms off, Elizabeth alone at fire. Some people can be such idiots. You're so lucky that you can't see the garbage and the poverty and all the ugliness of this world. Like I don't know it's there. <laughs> How can you not know it's there? It smells, it has sounds and feelings. Do they think I can't feel? Oh, I wish you could see that. I just feel so bad that you can't see that. They're all so predictable. When did you go blind? <laughs> go to hell. It's none of your business. If you can't bother to get to know anything else about me first, then don't bother to ask me when I went blind as if it's the only thing about me that matters. <sighs> she feels for the twigs, selects one, stands before the fire, takes a deep breath, throws twig on fire. <sighs> My 
but not to do when you're dating a blind person. Rule number one, do not push me into a chair leading with my ass to find the seat. <laughs> Rule number two, you don't have to speak for me. My mouth works quite well, thank you very much. <laughs> Rule number three, gesturing to others in order to communicate as if behind my back is rude. It's not as if I don't sense that something is going on. Rule number four, do not pretend that you are not in the room in an attempt to ignore me. Just watch. I'll die old, alone, and blind. <laughs> now there's something to look forward to. <sighs> Casts another twig on the fire, turns 90 degrees, holds arm up. Winds of the south, great serpent, thank you for teaching me to shed what no longer serves to shed the disappointments and frustrations of the past. Little girl runs in. Remind me only of the- Whoa, what happened to you? Life. Double woe. Ever thought of a makeover? Here, look at this new comb and brush set. I just got it for my birthday. I'm nine. And it's in this cool purple purse. Watch this. Brush his hair. I love my hair. It's so soft and silky. Makes me feel like I have angel's wings. Swoosh, swoosh. It feels so good. Here, let me do it for you. Brush his hair. I do this for my mom all the time. She really likes it. Sometimes she pays me, gives me a nickel. Or the one time, she gave me a dime. I took it to Sunday school for my offering. I was so worried about losing it. I put it in my mouth. You'll never guess what happened. I swallowed it. Tell you I was some scared. I thought I was in big trouble. My big sister Margaret, she's 12. She's always teasing me like, that's why you can save money so easily. Betty, I want to talk to you about the future. What? You're going to have to work three times harder than everybody else. I don't want to work, Papa. You're going to have to get three times as much education as everybody else so you can make lots of money so you can pay people to drive you around. I've got my bike. Besides, you can't talk to me this way. It hasn't happened yet, remember? He's a little mixed up. There, does that feel better? It always makes my mom feel better. She has a really hard time sometimes, my mom. She sometimes can't get out of bed and everything is hard for her. She's sad and cries a lot. So I comb her hair. Either that, or I just stay out of the way and take care of myself. Till my little brother comes along. Then I have to take care of him too. Once my friend Colleen, she wanted to see his prize. Friend runs in. Let's pull his pants down, have a look. No way, that's bad. He can close his eyes. What? Do you think when his eyes are closed, he can't pants being pulled down? Friend goes. Can you imagine? Thinking he, thinking he wouldn't know just because his eyes were closed. That's stupid. You look way better now. But think about that makeover. See you later, alligator. She skips off. I remember that little friend and that purple purse and combing my mom's hair. It really did make her feel so much better. Even then I was her mother. I was always her mother. A shadowy figure with a masked jaguar's face creeps to the edge of the fire's circle of light. You must go back in time. The jaguar figure creeps away. A younger Elizabeth in a red dress confidently feels her way into and around the surfaces of a room. She makes her way to the phone. Elizabeth speaking. Hello, this is the Regency Bank. You don't need to in your own application. Is this a good time? Yes, actually, it's a very good time. I trust you have good news. The bank has approved you for a $12,000 unsecured line of credit. And the loan application? The documents are all ready to go. When can you come and sign them? She hangs up the phone and goes. Elizabeth sits alone at her fire, remembering the scene. The loan office at the bank. A vulture-masked loan officer sits behind a desk, flicking through paperwork. A folding chair for clients sits in front of the desk.
Younger Elizabeth makes her way into the loan's office with her paperwork, wearing dark glasses, using her white cane to guide herself. Hello. Is this the right office? Have I made a mistake? I'm here to talk to someone about a loan application. Miss Barber? Yes, that's me. Good to meet you. Are, are you here alone? Don't you have a companion? I beg your pardon? Well, someone with you, you know, with you. Loan's with officer me? grabs her and shoves her into the chair. I'll be right back. I need to get my manager. The loans officer goes. Younger Elizabeth straightens her clothing and checks her paperwork. Guess there's a problem. The loans officer returns with her boss, a vulture-masked man. Young Elizabeth puts her hand out to shake. The female loans officer ignores her. I seem to be missing something. The male loans officer strolls about, flicking through Elizabeth's loan application. Ahem, <clears throat> Miss Barber, this is your first... Loan application, is it? As you know, times are difficult and banks are being very careful now. The female loans officer answers the phone, glances at her boss. I'll be right back. I need to take this. She goes. You understand. <clears throat> Actually, I'm quite confused. I have had several loans before, together with my ex-husband. Ah, yes. And I see you have no delinquent payments, but what I mean is you've never applied for a loan independently, is that correct? Female loans officer comes back. As you can see, Miss Barber, I mean... I understand. It's just a figure of speech. What is it you're trying to say? Well, this document is actually 15 pages long, and you won't be able to read it. Am I right? I can take the document with me and have somebody read it, if that would help. Yes, but how would we know that you actually had it read to you? First of all, I am quite familiar with these loan applications. Second, you can't tell me that everyone who comes in here reads these before they sign. I understand. <clears throat> Ms. Barber, we would like you to secure your own lawyer to finalize the application. But the bank already has a lawyer for this very purpose. Well, it's actually in your best interest to... Get your own lawyer. <laughs> I'm confused. You indicated over the telephone that everything was in order and all I had to do was come in and sign. Perhaps a co-signer. If you had someone to co-sign the loan for you, then the bank would be happy to provide you with one of our lawyers. <laughs> Who keeps calling? And what about the $12,000 unsecured line of credit based on my AAA credit rating? Ms. Barbara, it is true you have an excellent credit rating. We would certainly love to have your business, but we have been advised and we must insist that you secure your own lawyer to finalize the application. Younger Elizabeth jumps to her feet and storms out. The loan vultures hurl her papers in the air. Elizabeth at the fire yells at them. Be quiet! The loan vultures disappear. I'm here to get some peace and quiet and some insights and answers. She feels for the pile of twigs, selects three. She gets to her feet holds one twig up. This one is for the entire banking establishment. She blows on it three times and tosses it into the fire, holds up the second twig. And this one is for the legal system. Breathes on twig, throws it into fire, holds up third twig. And this one is for Alexander Graham Bell, the jerk who invented the telephone. <laughs> Breathes on and tosses the third twig, holds up her right hand. Calling the winds of the west, great jaguar, thank you for protecting my sacred space and for teaching me the way across the rainbow bridge. Thank you for teaching me to walk impeccably while leaving a soft footprint behind. Ho! The little girl, Beth, rides in on a bicycle. Urch! So I'm a little bit late. There's a lot going on, you know. We're moving to a new farm. I've lived in the city since I was two years old and my dad has had enough. I've got farming in my blood. This city life is killing me. Well, we wouldn't want that now, would we? So we've been packing. I got the measles. It was the German measles, wasn't it? Nope, the red measles. Is your memory going? It happens with age, you know. Yeah, that was Margaret with the German measles. That's right, the red measles. After I'd just gone back to school, after getting hit in the head by that flying maypole, oh. Blood everywhere. Blood all over that new dress. I had to go home and change. 
Couldn't believe Mom sent me back to school after that. Probably should have had stitches. And though that wasn't just quite enough, do you know what happened to me at school after getting bonked in the head? After the blood? After Mom sending me back to school with a clean dress on? After the measles. You got put in the corner. And for what? The teacher storms in and lectures little Beth. Elizabeth, what are you doing? Why aren't you in your desk? I'm finished my work and I don't have anything else to do. Well, you could just sit in your desk quietly. Why were you just wandering around the room? She was helping them with their math. You were giving them the answers? The other students won't learn if you're doing their work for them. Come over here and stand in the corner if you have nothing better to do. And think about your behavior. Teacher goes. That was a really hard day. You can't do somebody else's work for them. It took me years to learn that. <laughs> Elizabeth's head tilts towards the sound of the eagle. Good riddance, that was the end of city life. And that school, and that teacher. We moved to the farm after that. Fresh air, lots of space to ride my bike and run. I love the farm. I love running. When I run, I'm the wind. I ride with wind just like a bird. A huge bird with outstretched wings. And I go higher and higher until I'm so high I can't put my body anymore. Elizabeth smiles as little Beth skips around her. Little Beth cradles Elizabeth's cheeks in her hands. It's almost time. Are you ready? Little Beth gets on her bike and cycles away. The jaguar-masked form creeps out of the shadows to stand behind Elizabeth. Further back. He creeps back into shadow. Younger Elizabeth and a mountain climber friend are crouched, clinging to a rock face. Can you feel it? The stone? Yeah. It's steady, but cold. We must be climbing. We're getting higher, but we've also entered a bit of shadow. Uh, put your foot here. You got it? You steady? Yeah, that's steady. Okay. One more push and we've made it. They jump and land, <laughs> standing, balancing. Oh, that was great! Oh, I feel exhilarated. Oh, having my face so close to the mountain, the smooth rock on my cheek, the smell of dirt, the feeling of pebbles shifting under my feet as I steady myself. Amazing! What a thrill! Thanks for your help. Tell me what you see. Uh, it's the Sacred Valley of Cusco. Uh, there are mountains everywhere. Small villages inserted right into the sides of them. The trees are lush, green. Skies of deep blue. And now, for your viewing pleasure, the mighty condor. One of Peru's most sacred fowl. If that's not a good omen, I don't know what is. Excellent. On that note, I'm ready to climb that last bit. Shall we go? This is as far as we're going. What do you mean? I know there's more. I'm telling you this is as far as we're going. I didn't come in this tour to sit on my ass while everyone else does the exciting things. You just climbed up a sheer cliff. And we still have to get back down. I am going the rest of the way. Now, how do I get there? It's just a little trek on the other side of that rock. I'm going, with or without you. She crouches, feeling her way along the rock. No, 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 don't move. You have no idea how narrow this ledge gets. He shoulders his pack, squeezes behind and in front of her on the path, takes her left hand, and the two of them edge along the ledge to the top of the hill. I'd like to have a few minutes to myself. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sit, sit right here. And I'll come back for you in a couple of minutes. Sounds great. And Samuel? Thanks. Just don't move anywhere, okay? The platform you're sitting on is no more than four feet square. Gotcha.
younger Elizabeth dreamily gets to her feet and strolls off, passing her older self at the fire as little Beth runs in. You should have seen them all down there watching climb that mountain. It's like they've seen God. <laughs> How do you know so much? Because by day, I'm a nine-year-old girl who lives on the farm. But by night, I'm a sprite who spreads her incandescent wings and flies imperceptibly amongst the stars, the sun, the moon, and the clouds. How is everything on the farm? Mom tried to escape. What do you mean? She got in the car and tried to leave and backed right, right up into the corral fence. Dad was so mad. She was too afraid to come into the house, so I called to her from the upstairs bedroom window. Mama, it's getting dark. Please, come back in the house. Please, Mama. She went to the hospital again soon after that. You've got that glint in your eye. What are you thinking? There's so much space on the farm. I wake up at five every morning. I tiptoe downstairs, quiet as a mouse, past mom and dad's bedroom. Mom's not there now, but she is sometimes. I'm so quiet they don't even notice me. Go through the living room, out the front door, and then I run. I run through the field and the yard, and sometimes I go to the north road all by myself. The trees and the grass smell wonderful, and the air is so crisp. Sometimes I run so fast that I disappear. And it's so peaceful and quiet, except for the sound of the birds and the wind in my ears. I'm running so fast. Little Beth Snow grabs Elizabeth's hands and swings her in circles. The trees and the grass. The sun is rising and the air is already warm. <laughs> the sweet air fills my lungs with joy and freedom. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Mom's pregnant again. Ah, uh, yes, Christine. Conceived on a weekend pass from the mental hospital. Little Beth guides Elizabeth back to the fire. See you later! Little Beth skips off. Elizabeth raises her right hand and faces north. Winds of the north, royal hummingbird, you who demonstrate the impossible journey while drinking deeply from the nectar of life, thank you for protecting my sacred space and the lineage, old ones and young ones, my children and my children's children. To you I give gratitude. Ho! The jaguar-masked figure creeps in from the shadows, circling behind Elizabeth. Still further back. He goes. Younger Elizabeth, on the phone, paces in, using her white cane to guide her steps. Andrew, what do you mean you can't meet me at the airport? I might never see you again. I'm sorry, I just... I can't get the time off work, Elizabeth. What? I love you. You... what? I love you. And I'm gonna miss you. I wish you'd maybe consider cancelling your trip. Greece? Andrew, I don't think so. The flight is booked. There is no cancellation insurance. And Karen and Nita are counting on me. We've had this plan since last Christmas. You know I want to travel before I go back to university. I've just had the best summer of my life with you. I'll think of you often, every day, but I'm going. Younger Elizabeth hangs up, strides off. As older Elizabeth stands, remembering the scene, little Beth pops in. Andrew does meet you at the airport. When you get back, you know, it's a night flight. Everybody is sleeping except for you, and this old lady sitting beside you. You tell her all about it. How you don't know if he's going to be at the airport, and how you've had such a fabulous trip. But you're really hoping he's going to be there? The old woman helps us to the top of the escalator. She becomes the old woman. I see a man. He's looking this way. Yes, I'm pretty sure he's looking at you. He's coming closer. He's very excited. He's waving. Yes, he's definitely waving at you. I'm walking you towards him. He's coming towards you. Oh, I'm so happy for you. He came. Elizabeth hugs herself. Our bodies touched. And we hugged each other and we kissed. It was such a glorious moment. I couldn't believe he was actually there. 
And then I turned to the woman, but she was gone. Imagine that, appearing and disappearing, just like magic. Love's like that. When we left, we were so sad. And then him being at the airport when he got back made us so happy. What a twist. Is there anything you don't know? Sure. I don't know what you're going to decide. Decide about what? You'll see. Or maybe you won't. Catch on the flip side. <laughs> Little Beth skips off. Elizabeth feels her way back to the fire. She bends and feels for the twigs, picks up three, faces the fire. This one's for romantic mythology. Breathes on twig, throws it on the fire, holds up the second twig. And this one's for delusion. Breathes, throws twig on fire, holds up third twig. And this one's for ex-boyfriends and all ex-boyfriends to come. Breathes, throws twig on fire, turns to face the east. Calling the winds of the east. Thank you, Eagle Condor, for protecting my sacred space. Come to me from the place of the rising sun. Keep me under your wing. Teach me to fly wing to wing with the great spirit. Ho! She turns to face the fire. She turns her head from side to side, listening to the night. She nervously rubs her hands up and down her arms. She hugs herself. Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly. Birds fly. Oh. Jaguar masked figure appears. You came. You called. Are you real? As real as Andrew was. Five years of my life. We moved in, got engaged, and little by little I began to feel as though I might have made a mistake. My confusion deepened, and the whole time he's telling me how proud he is of me, because I never complain. He always said, if anyone would ever have anything to complain about, it would be you not being able to see, but you're never bitter, you never whine. I just love that about you. Translation. Little Beth in. You must never complain, you must never whine. You must always be strong for the both of us. Ah, oh, a galoon. I beg your pardon? Andrew, he was your greatest galoon, your teacher. Listen to the rustling of the trees and you'll hear the truth of what I'm saying. Consider all the teachers from your past, their many faces, their words of wisdom. Some teachers showed you the way to be, others. Others? He raises his arm. Mommy, look at me, watch this. See this, Mommy, see my scary face? Mommy, look what I do in school. Watch me, Mommy, watch me. No, look, I'm over here. Watch me, I'm hiding my bag. She runs toward the voice. Perhaps your husband can go back to the house to retrieve the tip of your son's thumb. <gasps> there should be enough there for us to sew back on. I hate myself for not being able to protect my child. And it happens on Mother's Day. Who do I think I am? A mother who can't even see her own son cutting himself. And now, there are young men, yes? Yes. And I love them to bits. And I wouldn't change a thing. Time is the great healer. And now I suggest we spend some time listening to the wind and hearing its message of healing. Breathe it in deeply. Let the wind comfort you. She makes her way back to the fire, sits in its warmth, breathes deeply, smiles. Now, even 
further. You are 17. A man in overalls paces. Younger Elizabeth runs in. Hallelujah, I did it. I graduated. I am never going back to school ever again. Betty, is that you? You're late. I was just talking to some friends about the high school graduation and lost track of time. There's someone here at the back of the store who's been waiting for you. Oh, who? A boy, you know, Brian. He's in the back. I should have known, an ambush. What? What are you muttering? Speak up. Tell him to go away. He's been waiting here for hours. He's a nice boy. Hours? Maybe he should get a life. Nonsense. Be a nice young girl and go say hello. I'm not feeling very nice at the moment. It would be better if he came back later. I'm not telling him to go away. If that's what you insist, you go tell him yourself. Do I have to do everything? What's the matter with you? I'll tell you what the matter is. I'm graduating from grade 12. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what blind people do when they leave school. Nonsense. Keep your voice down. There are customers in the store. <laughs> that's right. The customers. The store. The work. Endless responsibilities. I'm sick and tired of it all. I'm tired of this town. I'm tired of the farm. And I'm mostly tired of you. You and all your work, and your cows, and your chickens, and your pigs, and all the housework. And who is that woman you brought into our home? Lily. We're not doing just fine without her. But oh no, something else for the neighbors to gossip about. Do you hear me? I'm sick and tired of it all. Then I suggest you pack your suitcase and get out. He storms off, passing a smiling teenaged boy who makes a beeline for young Elizabeth. Hey Elizabeth, I want to ask you something. Brian, this isn't a good time. But I've been waiting here for hours. Get on with it then. Well, what is it? Will you go to the crowd with me? I can't even think about that right now. You sure you're not just waiting for someone else to ask you? Oh, this is making me crazy. Okay, okay. But you'll think about it? Yeah, I'll think about it. Yes! He punches the air and runs off. Young Elizabeth's shoulders droop. She makes her way off. Elizabeth, at the fire, gets to her knees, holding up a twig. This one is for my grade 10 French teacher, who said that a blind girl learning French was like a girl with no fingers learning piano. She breathes on it, drops it into the fire, holds up another twig. Here's to the boy who said, right in front of me. She's so cute, too bad she's blind. As though I was deaf as well. Breathes on it, throws it onto the fire, holds up a third twig. Here's to being the one left holding the joint, because I couldn't see to run away with the others. <laughs> Breathes on it hard, throws it on the fire, holds up another twig. And here's to being free of high school only to be clueless about what blind people do when they grow up. Breathes on it, throws it on the fire, places her palms on the earth. Pachamama, thank you for joining me in my sacred circle, you and all your children, who remind me the way of living in harmony. Thank you. Ho! The jaguar-masked figure appears behind her as a group of teenagers appear in the shadows. They are smoking. Now, you are 14. He goes. Hey, Elizabeth, pass that over. It's my turn. <coughs> Ew. I feel dizzy. A little sick, even. Don't worry about it. The film will pass. Hey, Brian, it's my turn. Ooh, an inhaler. How long have you been smoking for? Been smoking two or three years now. <laughs> two or three years? Where do you get the cigarettes? I say I'm buying them for my mom. I use my allowance. She'd kill me if she knew. Oh, yeah. My folks would have a fit if they knew I was smoking right now. I think I'll pass this time. I'm really not feeling well. It's almost finished anyways. Shit! What? Bust Her friends it. take off. Father storms in. Hey! What's this? I catch you smoking? What next? You're going to be smoking that dog? And where did you get the cigarettes? I suppose you got them from the store. My store! I didn't take them from the store. I didn't even buy them. Where did you get them then? Never mind. Now I can't trust you. Whatever you say. Oh, you don't trust me now? How about the housework? You trust me to do that while you're gone all day? And let's not forget my little brother and baby sister while Margaret helps you in the store. Maybe you can't trust me to take care of them. That's right. I'm 14 years old, and some days I feel like I'm 40. You can trust that to be the absolute truth. That's enough! I work hard to put food on the table and send you to school. A little hard work never killed anybody. And if you don't like it, you can leave! Don't 
ever let me catch you smoking again. Young Elizabeth cowers. He rages off, her shoulders sag. A blonde, vacant-eyed woman shuffles in and up to young Elizabeth. Mom, what am I going to do when I grow up? I don't know what blind people do when they leave home. Do they leave home? I'm scared, really scared. Don't worry. A man will find you and marry you, and he will take care of you. What man? <clears throat> no man is going to want to marry a blind woman. Do you know any other blind women who have husbands or jobs or anything? I don't know any. I need to lay down now. We'll talk about this later with your father. Oh, but I want to talk about it now. Dad won't understand. You're asking such big questions. I can't think. I'm too weak. I need to take my medication and lay down. She shuffles off as young Elizabeth follows the sound of her feet, then wipes her eyes. Brian runs in. Elizabeth, what's she up to? Are you crying? No, Brian. I'm worried about my mom. Oh, yeah. Did she flip out again? She's really nuts, isn't she? She's not nuts. She's sick. Really sick. And I hardly ever see her. I should have known better than to ask such a big question when she was only home for a few days. I was just so desperate. Well, why did you say no to ever marry you? Who's going to marry a blind woman? I'll marry you. She smiles. Oh, thanks, Brian. You're a good friend. It's OK. Brian goes. Young Elizabeth makes her way off. Older Elizabeth stands. She moves her head and arms from side to side, trying to find someone. Otorago, where are you? <laughs> the jaguar masked figure comes up behind her. So soon. I've had enough. I think it's time to stop now. I want to go home. I'm afraid to go on. There's something coming. I can feel it and I'm afraid. If you want to end it here, if you want to go home, so be it. But if you want to go on to face your fear, the fear of the unknown and the known, then I will help you. Oh, God. You must choose right now. All right, I'll go on. Look there. He waves his arm. Her parents walk in. It's been five years of city living. You seem better, are you? Are you better? I'm begging you. The city life is killing me. I have farming in my blood. That was the dream, to come to Canada and have our own farm. My blood is drying up. My dreams are drying up. My spirit is wilting. You seem better, are you? Are you better? For you, I will be better. Tell me that you're ready to move out of the city and to a new farm and a fresh start. I will be well this time. Tell me. For you. I will do it for you. It can't just be for me. We have three children now. I can work the farm, but you need to be able to take care of the children, Margaret and Betty and Gerald. When he grows up, he will help me out on the farm, but you need to be able to take care of the house and the children. That's all I ask. Little Beth runs in. Don't do it! The farm makes you sick! Tell me you really are afraid, and you can't do it! I want to do it for you, and I will try to do it for the children and the house. But what if I'm only well now because we're living in the city? Then you will stay here in the city with the house and the children, and I will go farm because I'm dying inside. Maybe I'm going to hell for it, but I'm going to farm if it's the last thing I ever do. I will go to hell with you. Little Beth grabs Elizabeth. The <laughs> parents go. What happened to me? Did they hate you that much? They don't hate you. If she wants me dead, I can feel it. This time she really will do it. I can feel it. It's him. I see it now. I feel sick about what she went through, what we all went through, because he has farming in his blood. He's the one with the trump cards. He's the one who's willing to throw everything away for his precious dream. It's both of them. It's their dance. Look up and watch the clouds. See how they change shape. Watch how they move and dance. They will show you a greater truth. 
They will show you wisdom and understanding about your parents. How they were both weak, but each in their own way, strong. I'll show them they can't beat me. You watch, I'll show them. You sound so angry. You're scaring me. The fire is hell. The farm is hot. The farm burns, remember? Do you hate me so much you want me dead? This time, I might not survive the burning and the fire and the heat. I'm sorry I was a girl. I'm sorry, I'll work hard. I'll prove myself worthy to be alive, but please, don't look back on the farm. Oh, I can't watch. I can't see this. I can't see. I can't see. Perhaps we've gone too far. What do you mean? Perhaps this hole cannot be filled. This is my life. I deserve to know what's going on. We don't want to see. It's better that way. I do want to know. I do want to see. You might not be ready to remember this, Elizabeth. It will take you to a place of no return. I don't care. Come back! Parents run in. Come back! How could you do it? What could you possibly have been thinking? I don't remember! When is this happening? Six years earlier, on the first farm. You don't remember what you did? I do remember. I just don't know why. I couldn't see any way out, and the shock treatments at the hospital makes you forget. Ah, yes, the hospital, while you are lounging about, having your meals prepared for you, sleeping all day, being given something to help you sleep at night. Let me tell you what was going on here the past eight months on the farm. I still have to work the field and take care of little Margaret. I didn't know what to do with her. I told her to sit on the little stool for hours while I went and worked the field. And Betty, God, Greta, our six-year-old daughter, how could you do it? I'm so ashamed of you. I don't know. There was so much work for me to do in the house. Carrying the wood, coal, water, endless washing, diapers. If only we had a boy, I would have been okay. We had a girl already. We just needed a little boy to help you with the work on the farm. That's crazy. This is crazy talk. What are you saying? It's the farm. It's making me sick. I told them at the hospital, it, it's the farm. The farm is my life's blood. It's the earth. It's alive. Growing crops, animals, fresh air. Yes, you're crazy. You're crazy enough to put a six-week-old baby in a... Christelle! Don't make me go back. It hurts. It hurts too much to see. See what? No, please. I'll be better. I'll take care of our little baby brother. I'll do all the housework. I'll prove myself. And you will, time and time again. I will. I'll prove myself. You will be an inspiration to all those around you. I'll work hard and make lots of money. I'll show them. I'll show him. You'll show him that father of yours. Then you show me. It's me who needs to see. I beg you. I'll take you. We'll go there together. Little Beth holds Elizabeth's right hand. Young Elizabeth comes in and holds her left hand. It's dark and scary, but I will go with you. Am I ready? It's your vision quest. I'll be here for you. Well, what do I do? Where do I go? The three Elizabeths walk into a pool of light. Take a deep breath, make your eyes go soft, and just look. It's something like a dream. Little Beth and young Elizabeth back away, leaving Elizabeth in the light, gazing straight ahead. I see a room. It's a kitchen, I think. Yes, that's right. It's a kitchen. It smells old. There's that red kitchen table we had on the farm for all those years. I recognize it with its smooth, cool top. There are the chairs that match the table, but they're new. No rips in the upholstery. And the high chair, that old high chair that we all used. And there's the old radio. It used to sound so tinny. And there's the slop pail. It smells sour. It's next to the counter with the basin for washing. 
The water is gray. There's the pail of water on the counter for drinking. It was hard work for my mother hauling all that water from the pump house. It was always so cold. She hauled the wood and the coal from the woodshed. The wood was dry and the coal black. In the winter, the hauling was harder. The wood and the coal were needed for building a fire in the stove and the water for cooking. And there's the stove. It used to smell so... Smell so what? What have you seen? Can you tell us? I see my mother. She looks so young and... And what? And beaten down. Go on. Go on. The stove. There's something on the stove, but it's confusing. It's like the water basin, but it's bigger, a little bigger, and there's something in it. What do you see? What's in it? I I'm not sure. <laughs> Is it possible? We're here for you. Remember, it's just a dream, a memory. We're here. You can see. What do you see? Oh my God. I see a baby. It's a baby. And that stove is hot. I know it. It's hot. It's too hot. The baby is screaming. Oh, it's just a little baby screaming so hard and so loud. Oh, please. Somebody has to help that baby. Why isn't she helping that baby? What is she doing? Somebody please help that baby. What else do you see? My father. There's my father, so young. He's busting in through the kitchen door. He's yelling at my mother. He's come right in without taking off his boots or his coat. And he's asking my mother. Grandma, what are you doing? My God, you have to help the baby from across the aisle. Oh, he's taking the baby. He's taking the baby off the stove. Thank God. Oh, the baby's still screaming. Oh, the baby is burned. Oh, no, the poor baby. My father is telling my mother to get in the car. My mother doesn't move. My father's putting the baby in a blanket. My mother still doesn't move. Why doesn't she move? My father is yelling and going out of the house with the baby. My mother is still not moving. Why isn't she moving? The baby is still screaming. I can hear it from outside. Is that all? No, it's quiet. Wait! The men are taking Mommy to the other hospital. Mommy, Mommy, don't leave me. I'll show you. I can be a good girl. You'll see. Little Beth runs off after her parents. Young Elizabeth goes. Elizabeth is alone. The jaguar-masked figure waves his arm. Elizabeth's father steps in. They stare at each other. You have come back to the present. You are 50 years old. Elizabeth, arms open, stumbles towards her father, stops herself. So you see, I saved your life. You saved my life, and then you risked it again. You risked everyone by moving back to the farm. You should talk, you and your spirit. Of all of my children, who do you think is most like me? Who is my will to get things done? My determination? My drive to succeed? Blood. You have farming in your blood. And you expected nothing less of us. Your children. Your wife. I should never have married her. Her parents told me from the very beginning she wasn't right in the head. But you married her anyway, knowing she was fragile. And then you pushed her to immigrate to Canada and to live on the farm. And you pushed her to have four children. I didn't know your mother was so weak. Stop blaming her! It was shameful to talk about mental illness in those days. And yet you pushed her. You pushed her until she cracked. And then once she was broken, you pushed me. And you're still pushing me! You're dead and you're still pushing me! I'm exhausted. I'm worn out. I'm tired of proving myself. But I can't seem to stop. Where does it stop?
<laughs> she collapses, hands on knees. <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid. When I was 15 and the soldiers came and told us we had 24 hours to leave our farm, I was not afraid. When I was 17 and I spent my birthday in a prisoner of war camp, I was not afraid. When I was 20 and I escaped across the Iron Curtain, risking being shot, I was not afraid. After the war was over, we were totally separated, displaced, but still, I was not afraid. But that, and I vowed I would never, ever let take, anyone take my home or my family away from me again. But that day, when I heard you screaming and saw you on the hot stove, I was afraid. And once again, I gave up my home and my family was at risk. I see. After everything else I had witnessed in my life, I was afraid. But somehow, I got through it, alone. And then you lost your sight. And it seems impossible to me, and two brain surgeries later, the doctor said there was nothing that could be done. So I threw my hands in the air and begged for God's forgiveness. I would never, ever let anything like that hurt me again. I see. I was afraid. I was desperate. I was alone. Forgive me. What's that? It's the bell of a child's bike. It sounds just like mine did. Your bike? You mean when you were a child? So you see, your father was a young child once. That child was lost to him bit by bit. Elizabeth holds out her arms. She and her father embrace. I forgive you. She takes his arm. He leads her back to the fire. He goes. She picks up the last of the twigs, holds one up. This one is for my father, who came to this earth to farm. May he rest in peace. She breathes on the twig, tosses it into the fire, holds up another twig. And this one is for my mother, whose love for a man ran deep, too deep to save her from herself. She breathes on this twig, tosses it into the fire, holds up another one. And this one is for the little girl who held the tension between them and would not let go. She breathes onto the twig, throws it into the fire, raises her right hand to the sky. Father, son, grandmother, moon, and all the star nations, Thank you for protecting my sacred space and for teaching me the way of mystery. Ho! Oh. She smiles. Marv the shaman walks in. Ready to go home now? Yes. So? It's not about getting my sight back. It's about letting go. She and Marv hug. I really feel that I should visit the gravesite of my parents. Come on, let's go now. I'll take you. She takes his arm. They go. The graveyard. Marv and Elizabeth, with two bunches of red flowers, approach a pair of graves. Marv helps Elizabeth to kneel down. She smiles up at him. Thanks, Marv. He touches her shoulder. He goes. She runs her hands over the writing on the graves, feeling for the names. She places one bunch of flowers on each grave. Side by side, 
Peace at last. From now on, I'm ditching the dance of darkness and creating my own new dance to see what the lighter side of life has to offer. Little Beth skips in, plucking at the petals of a bunch of daisies. Are you the bride or the groom? This isn't a wedding. It's a graveyard. And how did you get here? You summoned me. Plucks petals. You did? She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. Well, what will it be? I love you, little Beth. I love you too. They embrace, then stand together, gazing up to the sky. To the seventh sacred direction, the direction of the heart. Thank you for teaching me the way of love and compassion for myself and for all who have touched my life and for all the others yet to enter. Ho! Lights go out. End of play. As the lights come up, the full company forms a line across the front edge of the stage with Elizabeth at center. They all take hands and bow. They bow a second time. They raise a hand to thank the crew and bow again. They each raise one hand overhead. The company leaves the stage. Company credits. Director Philip Wagner. Playwright and production manager Ruth Bieber. Stage manager Haley Buzek. Assistant stage manager and lighting design Lolu Oyedele. Technical coordinator Jordan Davies. Sound recorder Mike Baxter. Prompt and backstage assistant Leslie Makings. Photography Lisa Hilbrecht and Annika Hodgson. Administration and programs Carrie Hodgson. The cast. Elizabeth at present, played by Janet Anderson. Lone Vulture One, played by Jenny Evans. Little Beth, played by Mae Glarum. Colleen, Little Matt and Corrine, played by Clea Hodgson. The Receptionist and Teacher, played by Mara Lawrence. Otorongo, played by David Madison. Ryan H. Twenty, Michael, Andrew, Samuel, and Lone Vulture Two, played by Zion Panagopoulos. The Father, played by Levi Perigo. Solicitor, played by Dorothy Steenwick. Richard, Brian, and the Doctor, played by Will Taylor. Younger Elizabeth, played by Amy Wagner. The Caller, Matt, aged 14, and Little Ryan, played by Curtis Walls. Marv the Shaman, played by Roger Ward. Thanks for listening.